Okay, so so I suggest that we move on with uh, Iris. That will uh, give us an overview of uh, financial regulations. Okay, so thank you very much, Florence. I'm a little not that tall. <laughs> So thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, I have two uh, tiny difficulties. Just a second, so. First of all, it's late and we're all exhausted. So I'm going to keep this short. And secondly, part of what I'm going to say has already been touched upon a little bit in the previous session. But let me try to give you uh, another perspective on things. So I was asked today to give an overview on uh, a comparative perspective on ICO regulations a little bit around the world. So what I try to do is to see whether there are tendencies, convergences, divergences, which would render the life of ICO project, uh, well, uh, projects easier because then you know approximately where you go with your ICO project. Um, but in order to do that, um, I necessarily needed to simplify things. So for the specialists among you, I uh, ask for your indulgence because in order to to, to, to show you the tendencies I think there are amongst regulators, I necessarily needed to simplify things. In reality, they're, of course, a little bit more complex. So, very, very, very quickly, because we've already seen that and heard that today a couple of times, ICOs are very similar to crowdfunding operations. It's a crowd sale of tokens, and they are inspired from an IPO. That's why you have the I, it's just a C that's changing. Um, you either use them, uh, which is rare, to, uh, to, to put a new currency into circulation, or more uh, often, it is to finance a project, okay? So, uh, I have to come back on the classification because that is important in order to understand how regulators, um, what approach they take. So, um, I have a slight difference with Florian you just listened to in the previous panel. I uh, distinguish currency tokens, which he calls payment tokens. So on this point, we are on the same page. It's just a wording. Uh, here you have all the bitcoins, the light coins, etc. And their basic feature is that they can be used to buy and sell any kind of goods and services. Then you have what is called a security token. Florian also uh, pointed that out, uh, which is most of the time either a share or a bond or some kind of other security. And generally, you will apply securities law. You also have what you call utility tokens. And here is perhaps the difference, because I still don't get his point with the app tokens. So the difference between the utility token and the payment token is that you can also exchange them against goods and services, but these are limited to one environment. So they're less universal than the currency tokens. These token classes are not regulated yet, but I'm sure they will be in the short future. Um, and also there is a point I will come back on. Most of the time you actually do not issue a token that already has utility. Very often it's an option on on future utility. Finally, you have asset tokens that res represent a physical good, and these might, in certain cases, be a derivative, so also regulated by securities law. And you have, I'm um, not so much interested in reputational or reward tokens, because they don't really it's not really a financial topic or a topic on regulation. Those are tokens that symbolize some kind of reward. You did something very special, a, a good deed for some kind of application, for some kind of environment, and it is a kind of reward. So obviously, they're not fungible. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about these kind of token classes. Now, uh, 
um, you, what are the approaches? You can have a very radical approach amongst regulators to say ICOs are banned. They are simply forbidden. They are too risky. There are too many people who put their money into uh, these kind of, uh, of uh, tokens and they actually didn't understand what, what was going on, what they did. So uh, me as a regulator, I want to protect them and I just forbid these kind of uh, financing methods. That's the option of China and that's also the option of South Korea, which is a very radical option. So once you say they're banned, they're banned. You can't do anything else, right? So as soon as you try to, uh, to issue tokens, you should take care to exclude these countries and not uh, try to target them. Um, uh, amongst the other regulators, there is some kind of consensus emerging on certain points, and there are still some divergences. So the consensus first is based on, obviously, um, the nature of the token uh, is important, and uh, substance is more important than form. That you have heard that already today. Now, uh, if I come back to my token classes, amazingly, currency-like tokens uh, are actually not regulated really. Why? And it's uh, a little bit amazing because the most, f the f most famous one, Bitcoin, right, is a currency token because uh, currency tokens, virtual currency, is neither in the legal sense of the term nor in the economical sense of the term money. Legally, in order to have money, you have a state monopoly to print money and you have legal tender. They have neither of these two characteristics. Economically, even though personally, but I'm not an economist and I would not dare to discuss that in front of economists today, but the IMF, um, some, the staff of the IMF issued a paper arguing that they, are, they do not fulfill the economical function of money saying that uh, economically money needs to be a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a reliable uh, store of value. Now, a medium of exchange, yes, but only if they're accepted. So you cannot impose payment in Bitcoin on anyone. Uh, a unit of account, generally speaking, you never say my house is worth so many Bitcoins you will always take the equivalent of a fiat currency to say it's so many bitcoins in a relation given that the price of my house will be so and so many euros. So it's not an independent unit of account um, uh, according to them. And the reliable store of value, it's, uh, well, it's uh, too fluctuating way too much and the market is not deep enough. So these are their arguments. I'm not going to go into them whether you can discuss them or not. I have my idea on this, but just to give you the reason why currency like tokens are actually not regulated today. So you cannot apply any kind of regulation related to money. Um, what is really amazing is that, for example, in French law, you have a criminal tax incriminating any issuance of new money, right? So I was thinking, if I don't apply that to anything that is not legal tender, not fiat, to what can I apply it at all? Because per definition, it's a state saying, this is your money, right? We have the, uh, the financial and um, monetary co code saying, euro is the money of France. So if anything else cannot qualify as money, because the law doesn't state that, I don't see how I can ever apply this text. Um, anyway, so um, now there are some exceptions with regards to currency-like tokens or payment tokens. You have some very... Weird, a very weird position, for example, of Germany, because in the German law, you have something that is called a unit of account, which is really just German legislation. It's not European, so it only concerns Germany. And it is weird because this notion was applied to the franc germinal, to the golden franc, to the EQ, and to the drawing rights of the a uh, IMF. And so they said, well, you can count in Bitcoin, so Bitcoin should be a unit of account. And if you say that, you apply, apply financial law. 
It becomes a security, right? But this is an isolated position. Then you also have a very interesting uh, case law of the ECG, perhaps the first in Europe that recognized that Bitcoin could be a currency, but it was a tax question. It was on VAT. Uh, the question was, do you apply VAT on Bitcoin transactions? And if you say it's a currency, and if you exchange currency against currency, you do not. Okay, so the ECG said, no, it's not. So you cannot uh, apply VAT according to the directive that was um, applicable in that case. So you see, you have some positions that are a little bit different, that are, that are a little bit, uh, well, questioning perhaps the main, main, mainstream. Then you also have a consensus amongst regulators, a little bit all over the world, uh, with regards to security-like tokens. If you have a token giving voting rights, promising you profits that resemble a share or something that is share-like or that resemble a bond or something, then you will apply regular securities law. And it's really a question not of how you call it, it's a question of what it really is. So you always have to ask what are the features. You have this consensus uh, a little bit in all jurisdictions, even though the notion of what a security is varies a lot. If you take the US, they have a very, very broad notion of securities with the Howey test you saw in the session before, so I'm not going to repeat that. You can see it on the slides. And compared, for example, to Europe a lot, so for the US and even Canada, Canada has a, have a, a very similar position, uh, almost anything can be a security uh, as soon as you invest money. And the American judges said, well, Bitcoin, even if you invest invest into an ICO using another cryptocurrency, it's some kind of currency, so it qualifies as money, and it is some kind of common enterprise. Well, if someone has to develop something you can use later, it's kind of a common enterprise, and you uh, expect profit out of that, uh, and you're not doing the job, but others are doing it for you, then it will qualify as a security. So it's a very, very broad notion. In Europe, we have a way more narrow interpretation of what a security is. Uh, that is the reason, by the way, why most utility tokens are not seized by financial regulation in Europe, but they are uh, in America, okay? Because we have a different definition. So in Europe, bottom line, you have shares or share-like uh, instruments, bonds, and you have derivatives, right? If you have one of those, then you apply financial law. So uh, security, there again, there is a consensus, even though the interpretation of what a security is varies a lot. Now, utility tokens, that is the only class where there are still doubts. How do we regulate? Should we regulate? Are they regulated? Right now, in Europe at least, they're not regulated yet because of our narrow definition of securities. In the US, they will be seized by securities law because they have a very broad definition. Um, but here, the catch here is the following. In practice, most uh, issuances of utility tokens are actually options on future utility. There is no, in the moment you issue your token, your, most of the time it has no utility whatsoever. Why? Because the blockchain, the application, the service does not exist. So you collect money, and it's, it's a financing, it's a means of financing. You collect money in order to finance the promise you made, the, the, the idea you had, the thing you described in your white paper. And given uh, this fact, you have some jurisdictions, it's the case of the US and Canada, but that we already understood. They say if a utility token has already real proved utility, then it will not be a securities law applying. But as most don't, they are just options on future utility, they apply securities law. And Switzerland has a very similar position. The FINMA, in the paper they issued, they had a very similar stance. If you have a real utility token with real utility, then they will not treat it under securities law. But if it's only an option on future utility, it becomes a security. And this is, I think, bottom line, this is perhaps the, the, the key point for regulators, the key question they need to ask. Because once you buy something that has utility, you 
you can use it. It's like going to Sephora, buying a voucher and exchanging it against perfume later, right? But if you invest into something that actually doesn't exist, how do you know that it will ever? And let's face the facts, 60% from what I read, but I, I guess there are more informed people in this room, 60% of all ICOs we've had, and it's very recent, I mean ICOs is a very recent phenomenon, are already failed or are about to fail, right? So, uh, and there have been a lot of scams. And uh, there are a lot of risks. There has been research done, for example, on white papers. 10% uh, of all white papers that were studied, and they studied like 100 of them, uh, only indicated, for example, the applicable law or jurisdiction. You don't, the problem with these white papers is that you don't actually know where to address your cl claim, against whom you need to address your claim. Uh, besides the fact that you do not always get the most transparent information. So here on this point, options on future utility, there is probably something for regulators to think about. Some of them are already reacted and others are about to, to, to do these. So on the other hand, you also had initiatives, uh, especially in the US, where, for example, the state of Wyoming and Arizona adopted a law uh, special especially on utility tokens, saying under these circumstances, if you do not market them as securities, if there's no um, repurchase right, uh, then they are exempt from securities laws. Uh, the only point is that Arizona, for example, said, yes, but utility has to exist upon 90, 90 days after you issued your token. So you see, they try to narrow the time frame down of the risk you face as an investor because it might be that the guy takes the money and goes to Bahamas and in the sun or does something else with it. So this is really the risk you face. Now, France, but I'm not going to, to talk too much about France because I guess the regulator is going to tell us this. There are also initiatives in France, some light touch regulation. I have a couple of, uh, well, questions or reserves to, uh, to, to express uh, given the project I've seen, but I'm not sure that that is actually the project that will be adopted in the end. Um, well, in France, we've had an ordinance already, the first one that actually said, look, this is a definition of what the blockchain is. You can issue mini bonds on a blockchain. You can issue uh, shares of non-listed companies on a blockchain. We're still waiting for the decree, but France has already done something in order to enable uh, even security-like tokens, because I mean, when we talk about shares, be it listed or non-listed, it's, it's still a share is a share. So there have been in initiatives and uh, you also have the the consultation of the AMF and then the project I guess you're going to talk about uh, just in a minute. Now uh, before I finish um, just perhaps one word um, I think really for me perhaps the point for regulators is that one we cannot ignore that when you issue a utility token for something that does not exist yet then you face, it's not, it, saying that they are not regulated doesn't mean that is a, it is a, legally, a legal vacuum there. And perhaps that is the point that would need some intelligent regulation because there are an, it, undeniably risks for investors. And also, it, if I say they're not regulated, I don't mean by that that, for example, consumer law doesn't apply. If there is anything happening, there is some kind of agreement there. There are some kind, there is some legal ground to sue and to try to obtain damages if whatever, the guy takes the money and runs away with it. The problem you will face is a problem of law, uh, applicable law and jurisdiction. Because even if a country adopts a law, generally it depends on how you adopt it, what the criteria is. You could, for instance, say, look, if you want to sell them on my territory, these are the conditions in order to protect my investors, okay? Or you say, well, if you're established on my territory, these are the conditions you need to issue something. With the pr from the perspective of the uh, project, um, well, of, of the project, um, 
it, the complicated side is that they need to face a lot of jurisdictions. When you have an ICO project, of course, you should, if you don't want to be seized by financial law, you should avoid anything that is security-like. But still, you need to comply with potentially every jurisdiction you're going to sell your tokens to. And that is extremely costly because you need to consult uh, different legal advisors. Um, and that is something, um, well, uh, where it would perhaps be interesting to have some kind of standard so that uh, it's easier for them to know, well, look, these are the rules. It's, bottom line, it's more important to have clear rules than to have a position where you don't know exactly what the position of the regulator is. So even if you say, look, if you want to sell them on my territory, these are the rules. At least people know what they need to do. And if they don't want to, then they don't sell them, and then you protect your investors, okay? So I think these are the areas where, um, where Europe, not only France, not only Europe, and the other jurisdictions need to evolve a little bit. But the strong stance taken by the US regulator, and also we see Switzerland saying, look, okay, guys, utility, I agree, but is there really utility? I think that also is kind of a direction. I don't know if it's the right direction to take, but I think we should give it some thought. Thank you very much. Any question? Yes, just a quick, quick question related to your last point. So. I've seen many uh, discussions of the legal framework, but at the end, uh, there's something I don't understand, uh, and it's related to what you said, that in the end, when you raise an ICO, you, anybody can, fine, you can do KYC, but in principle, anybody come from anywhere could uh, give you money. And so, I mean, then you end up with uh, basically a lowest common denominator, which is you're going to be subject to the worst jurisdiction. No. Is that right? Or? Yeah, well, it's a little bit more complicated. You can make a parallel with, for example, libel on the internet. Okay, we've already, it's not a new question. When you have libel on the internet, potentially you can reach anyone because the internet is ubiquitous. And uh, the, um, the case law um, developed a criteria called directed activity. If you direct your activity to a territory, then you might be sued for damages. So here, for example, if you say China, you know China banned the uh, ICO, uh, banned ICOs, and you also know that, for example, the American regulator is pretty strict saying that, well, almost anything is a security, and if you do not comply with securities laws, you're not allowed to sell them into US investors. So what you can do is say, I exclude China and I exclude the US, and then do you, you take some reasonable steps, for example, targeting IP addresses to exclude investors coming from those regions. In that case, you, you might argue that you comply with these regulations and you won't be sanctioned. Thank you very much. Um, you made a parallel with the crowdfunding, but uh, so far no crowdfunding platform or no cr crowdfunded uh, project was regarded as a security precisely because uh, there is no return on investment. It's not uh, what you pay for is like kind of a love money and then you get uh, something in return which is not a dividend or anything like that. But for the vouchers, for the what somebody else called app uh, token, is it something that is uh, like the equivalent of uh, of the crowdfunding and that th that could stay uh, outside of this uh, financial regulation? Well, I wasn't when I was referring to crowdfunding. I wasn't referring to the f project finance. I was referring to the idea that you address yourself to a crowd and try to um, uh, collect um, even very tiny sums of money from a large crowd. So that is the common pi point with crowdfunding. Crowdfunding has been regulated. So it depends on what kind of crowdfunding we're talking about. You have in France regulation for security 
crowdfunding, for uh, loan crowdfunding, and uh, even donation, which is not regulated in itself. But if you, for example, give your money for free, then it would be a donation, and you can still do it as a crowdfunding. So uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure what you want to pinpoint on. No, it, it was about like if you don't have any secondary market to to exchange that token for money, mm -hmm. uh, if you only can use it for that utility, even if it's a future option, even if if it's you, you're kind of investing in something, but which will not give you return. Uh, sh should it be financially regulated like any other security? Well, um, in with regards, should it? It's an interesting question. I think you have to think in terms of risk for the subscriber. Is there a risk for the subscriber? And the risk I see is that the guy you're giving the money to is never delivering on his promise. And that is, bottom line, the, 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 the only point that would need some kind of regulation. I don't mean by that that you have to regulate everything like IPOs. I think that is not a good idea. And given that crowd uh, that uh, ICOs developed for a reason, the reason is that banks cannot lend that easily anymore, that as a startup you will never ever get credit from a bank. Uh, so it, there, there are practical reasons why this developed and you shouldn't uh, completely suffocate it by regulating it. But if you give at least a minimum amount of information and transparency to the uh, subscriber, I think you kind of owe him that, right? And a lot of papers are only concentrated on the technical side and they give very, very few information on the legal aspects. I don't mean by that that you need to deliver a prospectus or that you need to comply with a very heavy regulation. I just think there is a risk for the subscriber that you do not what you said you will do. So what will happen to him then? Of course, he will lose his money, he will be unhappy, unhappy, he might try to sue you if he knows where, how to find you. So it will be pretty complicated for them. And I don't think it's illegitimate for a regulator to, 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 to protect his investors. So that is the only point I'm saying. I'm not saying that if you have normally, if you have a real utility token, if there is utility, it shouldn't be, because if you regulate that, you need to regulate the Carrefour and Sephora who are giving out vouchers or gift cards or stuff like that, and that you don't want to. Um, but if there is a risk that you do not do what you said you would do, Okay, so... Uh